Morning, everyone. <laughs> welcome to New Life Alliance Church. We welcome you here in the congregation and those that are tuning in. We love you, Lord. We praise your holy name. You are God, the almighty God. Thank you for this beautiful day, O oh Lord. Thank you for waking us up this morning yes. to praise and worship your holy name. Let's rise and pra praise the living God. Our Savior lives. He will reign forever.
praise be to God. Glory to your name. Father, in this place, this very day, may your presence rise within us. Father, may your spirit fall afresh upon us. In this place, this very day, Father, may we encounter the living Christ. We know that our Savior lives. Let all the redeemed say so. Amen. Amen. Father, I would invite you in such a way as that you work within our hearts and within our minds. That as if we gathered here to honor you, may you lead, guide, and inspire us today in the name of your son. Amen. Amen. May be seated in his presence. Is that me? I'm looking for Rhett Paulson. Is Rhett here today? Not Rhett. Rhett coming today? Sometimes it's here, sometimes it don't. Oh, it's all right, right. I'm glad that, well, no, nah, no, nah, all right. So we're going to pray, we're going to pray for Rhett. That, that's, is that, is that, is that her puppy? Is that, is that Parker? Yeah? No, nah, that's her little puppy dog. Oh, she's walking in the Let's wait, let's wait, let's wait for her. 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 Oh, there you are. We can wait, we can wait, we can wait. We love her, we can wait, we can wait, we can wait. Yeah, red, 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 Come on now! There you are! We just want a dog on you, girl. It's your puppy, exactly. Come on, girl. So God bless you, girl. So glad you're... Wow, is it cold out there? Is that what's going yeah, on out there? <laughs> How might we, as a church family, pray for you? Um, well, obviously, the Ukraine situation is heavy on everybody's heart. But yeah. Overseas, yes. personally, yeah. I would say just contentment with where God has me at the moment. Mm. Contentment with where God has you at the moment. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, we can pray for that. And a deeper in a deeper walk with the Lord. All right. Okay, let's pray for our dear sister. Father in heaven, we just want to come before you and we want to celebrate our dear sister, Red. And Father, we uphold her before you and pray that you would continue to work in her life. Father, that you would continue to fill her with your Holy Spirit. Father, that she recognizes the love and the joy. And Father, the contentment that she has with being in you. Father, I pray that... But whatever may come her way, Father, whatever may fill into her eyes and into her mind, Father, I pray you make it holy. And, Father, that as she sees you at work in her life, she rejoices in your presence. And, Father, of course, our hearts are with those that are overseas and struggling and the refugees and a war and just, Father, evil is present everywhere. And, Father, we pray for our dear sister's protection as well. May you keep her from harm from the enemy. And Father, I would pray that you would continue to protect her in such a way that she rejoices and sees that you indeed are leading, guiding, and inspiring her moment by moment. I pray, Father, for a deeper walk and a deeper understanding, the love that you hold for her. Continue to fashion us and mold us to become like your son. Father, we come before you again in the name of your son. Amen. We love you, girl. God bless you. We love you. We love you. I know some people want to make announcements, uh, so uh, let them make announcements. Let it be so. May there be announcements in the house. Thank you. Hi, guys. So we're going to have a meet. I'm going to have a meeting this Wednesday at 7 p.m., a children's ministries planning meeting. So we're going to plan for Easter. We're going to plan for different things we're going to do to kickstart Wednesday night activities again for the kids. We're going to plan on how to reach out to the community to bring in some kids. <laughs> so I can't do this alone, obviously. I have God. I have Pastor Stan. I have everybody around me. But I need physical boots on the ground kind of people too. So, 7 o'clock this Wednesday in the children's church first classroom, formerly known as the nursery. And I hope to see you there. Thank you. That's it.
I tell you what, if you don't have a doghouse in the church, you're missing out on something. <laughs> I shared this last weekend when I was away. I said, I told them the story behind the doghouse and the pastor. And of course, these people were dog owners. Oh, that's so great. That's so, and I'm telling you, a lot of people, oh, boy, the churches just get dog houses, but actually love on them just like that dog does. Just like God loves on us. Amen. Amen. You'll probably see this over the overhead. You may not see it, but I'd just like to remind you of the uh, Missionary Flights International Banquet coming up this uh, Friday evening at 6 o'clock at the West Palm Beach Marietta. Now, they had a sign-up sheet. I don't see it out there this morning, but I do believe... Did somebody say something? I do believe you can still show up and they'll make room for you. Am I right on that? I think that's happened in the past. So listen, I would encourage any of all of you who are interested because they're a great organization. You know, our brother Sam spent a, a long career flying those planes for them. So, what? What? Yeah, are you okay? <laughs> okay, Sam is not here today. That, that's official. But Sam, uh, I just threw that out because Sam, that's near and dear to his heart, and especially this banquet. All I have left to say is, check this out. <laughs> Let's all rise and continue to praise our God. He's our Redeemer, and again he lives. We'll raise a banner unto the Lord, Jehovah Nissi. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
change, my change of heart, God, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a love, His mercy reigns, unending. grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord, for your reckless love. You went out in search for that one, oh God. You knew us and searched for us even before we knew you, oh God. We thank you for your unfailing love and your unfailing mercy and your unfailing grace, oh God. What are we that you are mindful of us, oh Lord? Without you, we are just dust from the ground. But you breathe the breath of life your spirit, oh God, within us, oh Lord. Let us be the glove, oh Lord, and you be the hand. Now when you say go this way, we go this way. When you say be still and know that we are God, that you are God, you are God, Lord. You are God alone. And we will be still and know you, oh Lord. Thank you for not giving up on us. When we didn't know you, we strayed away and did our own thing, oh Lord. And, and we're living a life of sin, oh God. Thank you for your righteousness that covers us, oh Lord. We give you praise. We give you praise. We pray right now for the reading of the word, oh God. That you will give us ears to hear and a heart to receive and understand. And we pray for the message, oh God, that it will touch our hearts. And that we will be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. And that we will love God with our whole hearts and our whole soul and our whole being and love others. For this is God's will and this is God's way. Amen. You may be seated. What is church? Is it a building? With some pews? A piano? And stained glass? Or is it something more? 2,000 years ago, the church was born. It wasn't made up of the famous, the rich, or the powerful. It was made up of everyday people who passionately believed in the message of Jesus. It was the beginning of a revolution of love and freedom that would change the world forever. In 369 AD, the church built the first hospital as a place to care for those who cannot care for themselves. Today, the church is the largest single provider of healthcare in history. The church was the first to stand up for the rights of children, creating the first and largest orphanage system in the world. 100 out of the first 110 universities in America were founded as Christian institutions. Places like Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, and Princeton. Much of the world's greatest art, architecture, literature, and music has been shaped by the church. But the impact of the church isn't just ancient history. Today, the church is stronger than ever and continues to impact every corner of the world. Over 300,000 churches in America and almost 5 million churches around the world stand ready to be instruments of change, to do what governments could never do. Every day, the church brings food and fresh water to millions of people across the world. It has a renewed passion to help widows and orphans and fights to free slaves in every part of the world. It stands ready as a first responder on the scene to provide relief for victims of disaster. The ripple of Jesus' impact can be clearly seen and felt in the church today. And it's made up of people like me and you. Today, you didn't just come to a building. You came to a revolution 2,000 years in the making. The world is facing as much trouble as ever. But we are not afraid. We were created for such a time as this. We will continue to do what we've always done. Proclaim the message of Jesus to help a world that needs him so desperately. Welcome. 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 Welcome to church. Yes, welcome to church. I can't think of a better place to be than at New Life Alliance Church. Every Sunday morning for the worship service, the Sunday school, just being in the house of the Lord with brothers and sisters. And now it's time for the reading of the scriptures. Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and lost one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors 
together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has, a ten, has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger man, the younger son, got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole, in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make like... Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and ask him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your pr property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because the brother of, your, of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God bless the reading of the word. Thank you, Jess. Right. Appreciate it, brother. So most of us are familiar with the parable of the lost coin, lost sheep, and lost son. Most of us. Most are kind of familiar with some of that. Uh, it's not unfamiliar to those that would uh, attend church more than, you know, once or twice a year. Uh, you'd, you'd, you'd catch this story somewhere along the line. It's, it's a very classic chapter. In that sense, it's a parable. You should know something about parables. Parables have one main theme. They must be taken in context. And they must be in agreement with the rest of Scripture. So oftentimes, parables are taken way out of context and used in other circumstances and situations. That's proof texting, 
right? Really, that's really, I have a circumstance and a situation. Let me find some passage of scripture that can kind of, that I can put to that. But you're taking the way out of context. It's not even similar in its, in its respect or its story. And so we'll look at the passages and we'll dissect all the, you know, the story and the parable. And we love to dissect all that. And we'll talk about that and we'll go through all of that. Jesus spoke in parables. Anybody tell me why? Those that have ears, let them hear. What else? Jesus spoke in parables. Why? To, to lay out a secret meanings for those that were... How about this? Ready? We'll, we'll even touch on this next week. He poke, spoke, he poke, he spoke in parables as a fulfillment of prophecy. This is just another way in which he was the Messiah and the fulfillment thereof. Okay? He spoke in parables so that he would be looked at and understood to be the fulfillment of prophecy, the Messiah. Not a rabbi, not a teacher, the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself. Now, we kind of have to take a look at the story around the story. I want us to understand that a little bit, okay? The tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around him. Tax collectors and sinners are all gathering. Everywhere Jesus went, he gathered a crowd, right? Crowds were following him. He's teaching Sermon on the Mount. Teaching. There's crowds of people following him. So now there's tax collectors and sinners. They're all gathering around him. And the Pharisees, or but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes, right, all muttered to themselves, this man, referring to Jesus, welcomes sinners and eats with them. So they're talking about the sinners wherever they might be. And the tax collectors are sinners. So the tax collectors and the sinners, they're all following this Jesus. And then there's the teachers of the law, the religious sect going, oh my gosh, he eats with these people? So there's a picture of what's happening around the crowd, right? That's around Jesus. So he tells a parable. So he tells a story. And you could feel the tension, right? There's a tension in the crowd, religious sect, and all those sinners. The broad strokes point to the story. Pretty simply, we kind of get it. Lost sheep, lost coin, right? Jesus came to reclaim that which was lost. And then there's this third story that shows God is far more interested in repentance and then punishment. Do you believe that, by the way, about God? That he's far more interested in repentance than punishment. But man is our flesh into punishment. Right? He loves people, and he's waiting for them to return to him. The mission of the church is not to isolate all the good people. You understand that? It's not to isolate all the good people. It's to welcome and save the bad people, which includes me and you. Right? Since I've got here, we've talked about this repeatedly over and over and over and over again. Is it get your life straight and come to church? Or is it come to church and get your life straight? Well, guess what's coming? Guess what's coming? And we have to be ready and prepared for that. And welcoming and loving. Many of us have been coming to church for years and years. And I'm still trying to work out getting my life right. So at least thank you for welcoming me here to be a part of this. I'm still working out my walk with the Lord. The teachers and the Pharisees that were there criticizing, right? Say, ah, he eats with the sinners and the tax collectors, right? <clears throat> they, didn't, they didn't like that Jesus associated with the unclean. 
those that were right disassociated, that had curses of God upon them, and the ways in which they thought about religious, they didn't, religion, they didn't meet any of that, right? Jesus hung out with the people that were sick, that were ill, that were troubled, that were addicted, that were angry, that were the outcast of the church, of the temple, right? Those that were in despair, those that are suffering, those that are walking in hopelessness, those that are not being encouraged in any way towards their relationship with God, but being pushed down in their relationship with God. And what was really annoying to the teachers and to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and what was really annoying to them is Jesus didn't care about what they thought. That annoyed them even more. He's not conforming to our religion. He's not conforming to the way in which we prescribe the law. Why is he associating with these people that are unclean? That really annoyed them. No wonder they're upset. People say, oh, oh, I introduce myself, you know, I'm a minister, I'm a pastor. Oh, you're a pastor. I say, I'm not really very religious. And I say, well, neither am I. And you know who else wasn't? Jesus. Wasn't a big fan of religion. The Pharisees' opinion, opinion of Jesus didn't really seem to care, concern Jesus much. He wasn't worried about their accusations. He wasn't worried about their gossip. Instead, he just continued to go to those that needed him to draw them closer to God. Thank God he did. I needed him. You need him. Jesus shares these parables to illustrate and shed some light on those that are listening. So who's listening? Sinners, tax collectors, teachers of the law, Pharisees, everybody. Everybody's listening. It's gathered all around them. And he tells the parables. The first two parables, something of value is lost. In the story, it's a kind of a lost thing. It has economic value, a sheep or a coin, right? And there is no one in that crowd that's listening, including the religious leaders, that wouldn't put forth an effort to go find the lost sheep, to go find the lost coin, to go find that which has a lost value. Everyone relates to that parable in which he's speaking. So you even have to ask yourselves, what do you value? And would you put forth the effort? What would you put forth the effort towards? My lost car keys? Yeah, I lost my cell phone. You're freaking out. You have a lot of value placed on that which was lost. And you will go through all the motions that is necessary to find and recover that which was lost particularly anything that is of monetary value. And the stories actually have uh, increasing increments of value, one in a hundred. He leaves the 99 to go get the one. And then the widow has 10 coins and loses one. You see the value ratio? And then it's about one-on-one. The first one, the farmer has the sheep, 99, the second, the 10 coins, and then the third, relationship. It goes from economic value, monetary value, to relationship. And we all agree, man, we would find that thing that has economic value, and we would go diligently to work for it, and Jesus goes, there's a father and a son. Now it's relationship. And do you value relationships and what do you value more what do you value most there's a lot of things that could be said about the parables and we'll jump into some of those but the common thread that goes through them all rejoice with me rejoice with me right the farmer in verse six his buddies all get together rejoice with me i found my lost sheep and then when the widow finds the lost coin, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. And then when the lost son returns, rejoice with me. That son that was lost is now found. There's a party going on. Rejoice. Jesus is making the point that the lost are found. And there's rejoicing that happens. And listen, 
it's really kind of saying, do you want to know what it feels like to be God? Do you want to know what it feels like to be God? When one sinner repents, we throw a party, baby. We throw a party. We rejoice. All of heaven rejoices. Angels sing when one sinner comes to know the Lord. That's what it feels like to be God. God is much more interested in rejoicing and repentance than he is in punishment. wanted to look at some traits. So I kind of broke this down by looking at some traits concerning the brothers and the lost son, right? The prodigal son that comes returns. So that's kind of the more popular one. We can all kind of relate to that a little bit better. But I wanted to relate in such a way as to think about what it is to wander, what it is to be a lost, what it is to, you know, be that prodigal Even be like the other brother, prone to anger concerning my other brother. Are are, are we like the prodigal son, or are we like the one that stayed? Are we like the sheep that meanders away, or, you know, we we the one that intentionally sins and moves on? And I kind of wanted to draw a little bit about that out for us, because I I know that God wants us to know ourselves. He wants us to know ourselves. And the reactions and the responses and the things that we do that get us into trouble and the things that bring us to our knees and the things that bring God rejoicing. But he also wants us to know how to relate to others. Is it in you know older brother way? Is it a Pharisee way? <laughs> See, one brother believes in this story that he is not ha- does not have the father's love. Why does he not have the Father's love? Because he has wandered and strayed and squandered all the blessings that the Father has placed upon him. And the other brother, at home, believes he deserves the Father's love, that he has earned somehow the Father's love. And God wants us to know him. Ultimately, we must know So how did this younger brother end up in all this mess, right? So now we could dissect the story a little bit. But I want you to understand there's a picture, right, a story going on with Jesus and all those that are around him and who he's telling this story to that we dissect and we pull all apart. But there's a bigger sense of what's really happening and what he's trying to communicate. So there's a pathway to the pig pen. There's a pathway to the pig pen. So he asks for the inheritance, right? Isn't that kind of like saying, I wish you were dead. Just give me my money. Right? So he was selfish and hasty. Here's your next one. He was selfish and he was hasty. He began to, he began out with a selfish act. And this is usually the problem we all end up with in our own self-centeredness. Hey, I want my money and I want it now. I can do more with it now than you can do with it. So give me my money. Show me the money. I want it now. I want to live my life now. And like many young men in particular that has to find their way, earn their way, make their living, it's a rite of passage. There must be this separation, right? I need my rum springer, baby. Let me go. I need to figure this out. And sometimes people have to learn the hard way, don't they? They go down many paths to the pig pen to realize, well, I don't want to take that path anymore, right? He acted hastily, acted hastily, and he took off to a distant land. Do we know where that distant land is? Took off to a distant land. Want me to tell you where the distant land is? I'll tell you exactly where the distant land is. One step outside of God's will for you. That's a distant land. It's not a matter of geography, right? Not just a matter of geography. One step outside of God's will, distant land. 
It's a broken relationship with the Father. And if you feel far from God, guess who moved? He squandered everything. There's your next one. He wasted everything he had been given. You know, and the word prodigal means waste, reckless, uncontrolled, extravagant. Did you think prodigal meant returning, son? No, no, no. Prodigal meant wasted, son, wasteful, extravagant, uncontrolled, and reckless. And when he left, he never intended on coming back. Never intended. This money's going to last me a lifetime. Uh, not quite. And he, 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 he ever, you ever squander your money? Anybody? Come on. Squander some money? Like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Any, am I the only one? Come on now. You're in church. All right, all right. And making sure you're listening. Uh, here's the next part of that. Have you ever squandered someone else's money? Man, not more hands go up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I squandered some of my dad's money. I can relate to this guy. Wish I had that money back. Wasted on fast friends, fast cars, and forgotten parties. And he separated himself. There's your next one. He separated himself. And he separated himself. It's funny because he separates himself and he gathers all the people around him to have a great big party, but he's isolating himself from all the important relationships. By leaving, he broke his relationship with his father, broke his relationship with his brother, any friends that were around, left his family and any of those. He rejected everything that was good and right and honorable. It all went out the window and he chose to leave. And it amazes me. It amazes me when we think about that and we try to put, you know, the, the father is the heavenly father and his God. He lets him leave. He lets him go. He chose to leave. And then what follows is your next one, a string of bad decisions. Just a string of bad decisions. Sin always works that way. One bad decision often leads to another. One lie leads to another lie to cover up the lie. And before you know it, you're 15 lies and 15 decisions down the road, and it just makes, I don't know, it's just easier to walk in the lie. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take long. Until, like this guy in the story, you get hungry. In that distant country, you can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Rum Springer, baby. But it comes to an end. After a while, the money runs out, the music stops, the beautiful people that used you all up can't be found, or they get bored with you. You're broke, you're penniless, you're isolated. In the end, lost everything. All that he wanted and lost it all. Now he sleeps with the pigs. Now is it, think of the story within the story, Jesus telling a story, is it significant that it's pigs? It's not, hey, he had a bunch of cows he longed to be with the cows. No, no. Not like, hey, he was living in the forest and there was a cage full of deers and he was sleeping with the deer. No, is it, it's pigs. So who's he speaking to? The Jewish people, right? This guy that he's describing, ceremonially unclean, religiously unclean. This guy is so far gone. Everybody knows what Jesus is saying. The Pharisees know, the sinners know, the tax collectors know. This guy is done. Way, way far gone. He's unacceptable. He's unclean. He's unapproachable. He's intolerable. He's offensive. And he's undesirable. The prodigal son hits rock bottom. Everybody knows it. 
doesn't God often allow that to happen? See, sometimes you don't look up till you hit rock bottom. When you hit rock bottom, then you look up. When you finally reach the end of the rope, then you begin to think about returning home. Only then we begin to take a good look at ourselves when we're that rock bottom. Think about this for a second. There's just a point that I'm trying to make. Adam and Eve in the garden. Walked with God, part of God, right? And then they disobedience, uh, right? Deception, they fall into sin. And God comes going, where are you? Where are you? Now, do you think that God doesn't know where they are? Or do you think that maybe he wants Adam to know where he is in a distant land? Far, far away. Where are you? Where are you? Are you wandering aimless? Are you looking to get out of the mud and the mire? Five words tell the story. Five words tell the story. He came to his senses. Five words tell my story. I came to my senses. That's the realization. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. When are you going to come to your senses? When will you return home to peace? When will you return home to my presence? When will you begin to walk in harmony with me and with others? When will you stop willfully sinning? When will you come to your senses and let go of the burdens? When will you stop flopping around with the pigs and all the mire and all the gossip and all the words and all the anger and all the bitterness and all the despair and all the resentment? Return from the distant lands. Come home. Come home already. Will you come to your senses? Willful sin is senseless. Willful disobedience is childish. Here's your next slide. Sin will. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Come to your senses already. Are you turning away from the living, refreshing waters of the kingdom of Christ in order to drink out of the septic tank? Is that what you're doing? Out of the septic tank of pride? Out of the septic tank of greed? Out of the septic tank of lust? Out of envy? Out of gossip? Out of jealousy? You wouldn't do that in your right mind. So you must be out of your mind. Come to your senses. Or, or, God just lets you go, turns you over to your depraved mind. And in this story, what brings the guy to his senses? What brings him to his senses? I'm hungry. (laughs) My stomach's growling. I'm hungry. His stomach made him come back to the Father. Now, that's not a very exalted, you know, theological, spiritual kind of motive. It was a physical need that was in his life, that propagated within his life, that drew him back. No one gave him anything. 
And he came to that place, the bottom, with the pigs. Totally intolerable by anyone that Jesus is talking to. Comes to his senses. And says, in my father's house, at least I can get a meal. Nothing in our passage of scripture suggests that he turned back because of he realized the terrible thing that he had done to his father. Nothing suggests that he comes to this, you know, awakening about his heritage. Oh, well, I can't, I can't be hanging out with the pigs. This is just not my heritage. He doesn't come to any realization like that at all. He comes to a realization of a physical need, a personal need, his need. I'm hungry. And then, then, he hears the startling truth. I can go back to my father. Servants in my father's house have it better than... Servants in my father's house have it better than I do. Servants in the kingdom of God have it better than the princes of hell. And here's a startling truth. People will turn to the Lord simply because there's nowhere else to go. Because there's nowhere else to go. God's the last resort. We try to make him our first resource, but he ends up being many people's last resort. And their motives, not very exalted, not very theological, not very spiritual, They're looking for a hot meal, someone to give them some encouragement and hope, or simply a listening ear. People come to the Lord for their reasons, not yours. How many people walk into this church trying to get their life straight? And we are to rally around them, love on them, dog on them, pray for them, uphold them in the midst of the mire as we help them out of the mud. I messed up my life so bad I gave my life over to God so that I could blame him. That's where I was at, folks. I'm done with me. I'm done with my string of bad decisions. I'm done. I've messed it up so badly. I'm going to give my life to you, God. I believe that you're there and you can have it. And now from this point on, I'm testifying that this life is all your fault. Probably not the most theological, doctrinal sense, but let me tell you, repentance. Repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of life. And there's lots of things that change people's minds, that draw them into a church that they would said they would never go into because it's their last resort. They have nowhere else to turn. The only place that they even begin to think that there might be some hope is in this place called church. And then they wander in. Do they find hope here? Do they find forgiveness here in the midst of the presence of God? Do they find reconciliation? Regardless of how they've walked in, how they're living when they walk in, here I am, God. I got nothing left, and I got nothing to offer. All I got is all I am, and I'm pretty messed up. You can have this life. Kill me if you want. I don't care anymore about my decisions. I give my life to you. The first step back home stemmed from a physical need. And now he begins to grapple with the root problem. The root problem, a broken relationship with the father. 
It's a broken relationship with the Father that needs to be restored. I begin to grapple with a broken relationship with my Heavenly Father. I've had enough of me. And because I meant it, I give you my life. And I would testify, it's God's fault. It's God's fault. God to blame. It's God to blame. Yep. God gets all the credit. He gets all the blame. For all the hope, all the joy, all the fulfillment, all the answered prayers, all the ways in which he's provided, God gets all the blame. And a restored relationship is that fundamental need. It's not food. It's not clothing. It's not a faster car and a bigger house. It's a fundamental need about coming to a relationship with the Father. And all he ever really wants is all of you. But you have to mean it. You have to mean it. And we all need a restored relationship with the Heavenly Father. In that regard, we're all prodigal sons in that regard. In this story, he could have had a million excuses, right? He could have had a million excuses of why I'm not going back. But he simply had too much need and was too hungry. And that's where I was. Too dark, too much in despair, too suicidal, too whatever you want to call it. Too much evil influence. And I was on the last thread. Maybe that's what it takes for you. But I can promise you this, people come to the Lord for their own reasons, not yours. And they will come to God as God leads them and brings them to rock bottom many times. And these words mark the beginning of a new life. When you stop making excuses for your failures, you're closer to a brand new life. And when you take ownership of the string of bad decisions, you come closer to a new way of thinking and a new way of life. When you cast off all the anger, all the pride, all the bitterness, all the despair, all the excuses, you start to come closer to a new way of life. And can you just imagine how this son made his way back to the father? Humbled, embarrassed, humiliated, heads down, approaching his father. Father, I've sinned against you. That's how I approached my dad. Not in a prideful manner. Dad, I'm, I, I, I wasted, wasted all that money. I feel like I've wasted my life. I avoided my father, my physical father, for years. Because I didn't want to put my head down. Feel the shame. Say, I've squandered it. Dad, I squandered it. I'm sorry I squandered it. You know what his profound words were to me? With a hand on the shoulder. <clears throat> Those were some expensive lessons, son. And that was the end of it. Those were some expensive lessons. And we moved on. And you got to know, I know, many of you know, the father must be feeling so much pain. You know, he's got to be in anguish. After all these years, after all these prayers, after, after giving him all kinds of money and help and assistance along the way, after all that, holding him in his arms, changing his diapers, drying his tears, after teaching him how to hunt and fish, after pouring out an ocean of love for him, suddenly the dream is shattered. The father's left with this huge hole in his heart. Words can't even begin to express the pain, the sadness, the loss that the father feels. My son is not going the way I would like him to go. He is not doing the things I would like him to do. And after all of that, man, who could blame the father if he refused to take his son back? He squandered all that money. You've been hanging out with prostitutes. 
You've done too much drugs. You've been living with three different girls. Who would blame him? What's he placing his value on? What are you placing your value on? What was my dad placing the value on? What was I placing value on? God wants you to know yourself. Who could blame him? Angry and bitter and upset with his son. And verse 20 just gives you the great moment. Just gives you the great moment. The father saw him. The father saw him just approaching, just beginning to turn to him and come and watch. Again, the story within the story. The father runs to the son. Do you think that's significant to the people he's talking to? He just came out of the big pen. And here come, and the father sees him. And the father throws all dignity aside. All proper protocol aside. All law aside. And he runs to the son and embraces him without saying a word. Throws his arms around him and kisses him. Before the son can even speak the words, the father already knows it's in his heart. People have often come to me and said, will you forgive me, pastor? I said, listen, before the words were in your mouth, you were forgiven. Because it's already in your heart. It's already in your heart. Oh, and the fears melted away from the sun. All the tears that just fell. All the hugs. Listen, they don't know a God like that. They've never heard of a God like that. They've never heard of a heavenly father like that. One that administers mercy and grace. No, no, no. We want the God of punishment, the God of law, the God of order. And here comes this crazy rabbi telling all of them and not concerned really about how they're going to respond or react, telling them this is how the heavenly father is. He sees the unclean son and embraces him. Wow. And then what do they do? They throw a party, baby. There's a big old party. Watch. At the Father's command. At the Father's command. The Heavenly Father says, we're throwing a party. Yeah, kill the fatted calf. Put a ring on his finger. Get a robe. Get some sandals for his feet. Come on. That which was lost is found. You are an heir to the king. You, 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 you are an heir to the king. And when does the party stop? When does the party stop? I don't know that it ever stops. I'm over here crying in repentance this very morning. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, please love me, accept me, take me back. I'm so ashamed of the ways in which I think. Oh my goodness gracious, the heavens are rejoicing over me. The heavens are singing over me. Every time I take a step out into the distant land, and I become aware, and I come back to the Father. There's repentance in my heart. God's throwing a party, baby. He loves for you to be in his presence, that party will never stop. When you come to know yourself and your own sinfulness, you can come to know the extent of the Father's love for you. He sings over you. Now watch. Do you think that in this story that Jesus is telling, all the people around him, when he gets to the older brother, do you think the Pharisees think it's about them? Do you think he's like, eh, maybe? Do you think it's about you? 
The older brother represents all those right-thinking, right-living, rule-keeping, pride-filled, self-serving people who want to see the repentant sinner publicly punished to teach them a lesson and to serve as an example for any other unclean people. That's the law. Just as the prodigal son lives today, so does the older brother. And we can pick on the older brother a little bit because I want us to know, kind of analyze in our own heads, am I like the older brother? There's some real things that happen on the path to the pig pen. And what does it look like to be the older brother? The emphasis would be self. It's all about yourself. Notice the emphasis that he even talks about. He was angry and he answered his father. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young thing so I could celebrate. You never did anything for me so I could celebrate. All about himself. And see, the, old, the younger brother thought he lost his father's love. The older brother thinks he's earned his father's love. <laughs> Are you sure you're not? Which one? Hmm. Some of it this morning stand in the shoes of the elder brother. Because it's all about self. Here's some marks of self-righteousness. I'll try to race through this. The marks of self-righteousness. God cannot fill you if you're already full of yourself. And believe me, I know some of you are really full of it. <laughs> yourself, that is, yourself. Here's your next one. It's an overinflated view of self. You have this overinflated view of who you are, right? Self-righteousness is always full of self-praise. They love talking about themselves. Look, all these years, I've been slaving for you. All these years, I've been doing this for you. I've been faithful, I've been loyal, I've been honoring, I've been working hard. From the oldest brother's perspective, he has earned and he has worked for, and get ready, here's the word, you're entitled. You're entitled. You're entitled to heaven. Why? Eh, I'm a good person. Oh, so the deeds that you do. Ah, oh, you're entitled to heaven. Yeah, well, well, you know, I didn't murder anybody. No, I'm, I'm better than that guy. I'm entitled. Yeah, you think you're entitled to heaven. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. There's not one righteous. Not one. Not one. Not one. Do you think somehow, wow, you deserve God's grace? Exactly what is the definition of mercy? And do you want some? The older brother's view of himself is that he is completely right. Completely right. It's the other mark of self righteousness. I'm right. God's not fair. I'm right. God's not fair. And let me just put an end to that right now. God is not fair. God's not fair. God's not into fairness. He's just not into fairness. You know what he's into? Grace. You know what he's into? Mercy. So in your own little mind, you're going to have to wrestle with, do I want a fair God or do I want a merciful God? Grace-filled God. It's going to depend a lot where you land in your walk. An overinflated view of yourself, your story, your worth. You're worth more than someone else. I'm entitled, right? Even my own brother. The second mark is a sense of being treated unfairly, right? I already kind of touched on that. You never gave me a goat. Never gave me a goat, but man, you threw a party, killed a fatty calf for my brother, squandered all your money. He never did anything for me. He felt like he was ignored or he was forgotten. 
This feeling of unfair treatment is always an initial mark of self-centered attitudes. It's the sign of a crushed pride, a wounded ego. This exposes the centrality of our own selfish ways and our own flesh. It's self-preserving. And the first place we always go is, how does this affect me? I did all this and you never. It's a common expression. Ready? Here's the common expressions that take place. Well, I'm just taking my marbles and going home. Now, I don't want to play. I don't want to play with those people. I don't want to play in that group. I ain't going to that church anymore. All about self. All about self. And then the third mark is we try to place the blame, right? It's all the contempt, the blame and the contempt for the father. There's no gladness that his brother's back. See, is there any gladness that somebody walks in and they kind of smell bad and look bad and they're hungry and homeless? Are we like, hey, welcome. <laughs> Want a hard-boiled egg? Or are we go, hey, he smells. He's unclean, unapproachable, and undesirable. You Pharisee. There's no respect for the father, right? The father ends up with all the blame. You never gave me. When this son of yours comes back, you squandered your property. You killed a fatty calf for him. Self-righteousness, listen carefully. Self-righteousness is one of the worst and deadliest of sins. It's the worst and deadliest of sins. I want you to think about it for a second. Even picture the crowd that he's talking to. The story within the story. Jesus, loving, kind, tender, gracious, and accepting of those in adultery, drunkenness, unclean, dirty. And he faces the self-righteous religious Pharisees in their smug complacency. He does not have nice words. You viper, you hypocrite. Doesn't say that to the drunkard and the sinner and those that are in adultery. You think in your self righteousness, somehow you're closer to God, that you're entitled to pass judgment on all others, and the judgment is being passed on you. Get out of yourself. No wonder, <laughs> no wonder. The Pharisees and the teachers, they're upset. Do you think they know he's talking to them? Do you think he's talking to you? Here's your next slide. I have watched as people have come to God as the prodigal only to be turned into the elder brother. They come crying, begging, hungry, at a loss, looking for hope, and they find Jesus, they find God, they find freedom, they find peace, they find harmony, they're in unity with the Lord and with his people, and then they judge the next one that comes crawling in, looking for hope. The sin is deadly because it's easily disguised as something justifiable. The elder brother is justifiable, and the Pharisees are justifiable. He is unclean. He is unsafe. He's not following the ways of religion. You keep the law, and you miss its intent. That's Jesus in the story. Grace is not an easy teaching. It's not an easy teaching. It's even harder to live. Many of us were very long on judgment and we're short on grace. 
We're mad at the politicians. We're mad at the media. We're mad at the president. We're mad at Putin. We're mad at China. We're mad at all those that live lives differently than we do. We're mad at those that cause me inconvenience. We're mad at those that are late. We're mad at those that are too early. We're mad at those that are too slow. We're mad at those that are too fast. Man, the whole world's just full of maniacs and morons. Yes. Will you get it? Come to your senses. Yes. Everybody in the world's as whacked out as you. Yes. Lost people are going to sin. They're lost. Christians are going to sin. They're not perfect. Maybe there's not much joy in your life because you've been long on the mad, long on the anger, long on the judgment. And God's trying to tell you, there's a party going on. There's a party going on. Exhibit some grace. Exhibit some mercy. Listen, as I was nearing the finish of this message, right, I'm considering that question. So which brother are you like? Right? Kind of analyzes, right? The self righteous older brother and paths to the pig pen. And, you know, which ones are you like? You know? And then the oh Lord was pretty clear. I didn't need to ask that question. What I needed to do was make a statement. And this would be it. Father, in this place, I pray that you would work within our hearts and our minds. We would become like you. We would love the older brother like you. We would love the prodigal son like you. Father, for any of us gathered in this place today, whoever we are, Wherever we're at, may our relationship with you be restored, refreshed, renewed. May our lives bring you honor and glory. In the name of your son, amen. It's a benediction that's kind of like a prayer. And maybe you might even say it someday. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. 
lead me in the way that is everlasting. May God bless you. Go serve your God. God bless you.